Visiting Scholars Conversation of the Fall 2020 semester. Tonight, we get to pick the brain of the CEO of a major company, Roto Rooter Chief Spencer Lee. I'm Lindsay Peralt. I'll be your moderator for this evening. And I want to remind you that this is an interactive session. So we welcome your questions. If there's anything you would like to learn more about, please do chime in. Before we introduce Mr. Lee, a quick word about visiting scholars for those who are new here. This is a collaborative endeavor between Purdue Honors College and other campus organizations to bring thought leaders, creative visionaries, and those who are at the forefront of their field to campus to engage with our students and with our community members. So we would like to offer a hearty thank you to the Asian American and Asian Resource and Cultural Center for making tonight possible. Spencer Lee has been at the helm of Roto-Rooter for more than 20 years. Under his leadership, the company stock price has skyrocketed and Roto-Rooter has expanded significantly. It is now the largest service provider of plumbing and drain cleaning services in North America. Lee immigrated to the U.S. as a teenager and became a naturalized citizen. He earned his B.A. in economics from Claremont McKenna College and his M.B.A. from the University of Chicago. He is married with two children and fluent in English and Korean. Spencer, welcome. We are so glad to have you here. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So as we kick things off, we wanted to begin with a question we are posing to all of our visiting scholars because this program is all about collaborative thought and building on the work of others. So we are curious, if you look back on your career, who would you say has been the most instrumental and impactful person in shaping your development? Yeah, I, uh, first of all, as a, as a Christian, I would say, Jesus is a very good role model overall. Uh, <clears throat> beyond that, I think we learn from lots of people. I don't think I have one singular person I want to aspire to be, but I've learned a lot from my former bosses, uh, my friends, uh, the athletes you see on TV. Uh, so I think every day we get we get we run into people all the time that we can learn something from. So I think you got to pick and choose. So. There's so many people that helped me along, and uh, from my roommates in college to uh, my four bosses, everybody really helped me a lot. And there's so many things I learned, just a little, little bit at a time from a person here there. Absolutely. Our students had a lot of questions about your early life and how that shaped your path as a CEO. So let's go back in time for a minute. Can you tell us a little bit about what life was like growing up in South Korea? Yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> very different. Uh, first of all, when I came to the States when I was 16 years old, uh, just just two months into 16, uh, my weekend double, that is uh, in Korea, Saturday was a normal day. People went to work and went to school. so. You know, it's a life was very different. It was very difficult. Uh, don't forget the Korean War ended in 1953. So uh, where I grew up, it was late 60s. Uh, things were still kind of hectic. Uh, there was a lot of people in small space. Uh, you know, this, my elementary school had 6,000 kids with a one wow. small field, which is the size of maybe half of a regular soccer field. So when I played soccer growing up, for example, there were usually three games going on in one field. And there were three balls with six teams on the field and we just play. And that's how we play. Um, you know, it, it was just, it was very difficult. I didn't know at the time, but I guess when you come here and you compare and look back, uh, yeah, it was pretty difficult. Uh, it, there was a lot of uh, military-like uh, management of students from school. There's so many students, you can't really manage them. So there's a lot of peer pressure. Uh, yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of group punishment. Happening. So you could be a good student, but they can get punished a lot. So I mean, I got physically you know, hit by teachers, not every day, but almost almost every day. So it was, it was, it was very difficult. Yeah. So when you moved to the U.S., you were 16, you didn't speak English. Take me back to the moment when your parents said, 
were moving. What was that like for a teenager? Yeah, it was, you know, I remember that we waited uh, probably for a year before we moved. It's not easy to just immigrate. You got to go through the process with a lot of paperwork. And I don't know why the delay, but there was a delay. So it gave us some chance to learn a few words here and there. But, you know, when you come here, they say something to you and I had, I could not hear one word. So, so it was, it was, it was, it was difficult, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the United States that I saw in the movies and TV shows and so on looked very nice. So, you know, my family, I think we're looking forward to it actually, uh, compared to life in Korea. I, we, we probably had this grand idea that it was going to be just a beautiful place. Uh, so yeah, we, we looked forward to, to coming here. So you talked about how school was quite rigorous in, in South Korea. Did that prepare you for the challenges you would encounter once you reached the U.S. when you started school without speaking English? Yeah, I think I think I, you know, I bought time because other than English, obviously, you know, the subjects like math and science and history and so on, uh, it, it was it was more advanced there. I think the Korean school system is good or bad, not necessarily geared toward making sure everybody goes up together. Uh, it, it was pretty much allowed the people that can run, allow them to run. People crawl can crawl. So it was, I think U.S. is more like they, they really want to make sure that everybody kind of moves along the similar pace. So Korea was a little more advanced in some ways because of that. So, you, so the like math classes were probably junior high school was probably a couple years ahead of what's here. So it, it gave me time to actually not have to learn English and also have to you know learn all the subjects. It would have been would have been almost impossible. So it gave me a chance to chance to study English somewhat and just kind of get by for a while. How did you navigate your your assignments and your coursework? Yeah, I, I think looking back, it, it was very fortunate in that when we moved here, we settled in a suburb of Los Angeles where we were the only Korean family. So when I got thrown into classes and school, you know, I, I had no choice but to just learn the language and survive. Looking back, I think if there were a lot of Koreans around, and there were some parts in LA, there was some Koreans around. If I lived there, I think my English would have come slower. Because I, I mean, you know, when you're 16 and teenager, you, you want to navigate toward just, you know, being a little bit more <clears throat> comfortable with your language and so on. So I would have probably spent a lot of time still speaking Korean, but I had no choice. Right? There was, other than my family, uh, it was, it was, it was, there were no Koreans around. So I, I had to sink or swim. And I think hindsight, I think it helped me. In addition to the language barrier, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the other cultural changes that you noticed when you moved here? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the things are just so different that actually, uh, you know, because we were, I'm trying to survive in school, I guess I didn't have a lot of time to, sit down and reflect on, on how the life was changing. So I, mean, I was trying to survive, I was trying to survive, okay? But uh, it was just very different. I mean, the food obviously was very different, uh, the, not just the language, but the people's people's behavior, uh, like like in classrooms, you know, in, in Korea growing up with the, uh, so many kids in classroom, you were taught not to speak until you're spoken to. So it wasn't just natural for me to raise my hand and ask, not, you know, not that I was able to do that well at the time, but things like that were just very, very different. So, but I mean, I was just busy surviving. So I don't think I had a lot of time to think about how different it was at the time. I mean, why? Speaking of differences, you wrote an article in the New York Times where you shared an anecdote about bananas. And it is really illustrative of, of the two cultural 
differences. So I wondered if you could share that moment with our audience. Yeah, yeah. There was, a, it, was it was actually I didn't write the article, but somebody interviewed me and, and wrote an article mm -hmm. about me at the New York Times that. I, one of the things I remember, because we were a middle class family in Korea, and we ate probably one banana a year. Well, it was very expensive, and it was, it was not common like here. So I remember we came here and went to a grocery store, and they were like bananas, <laughs> like, a, like, a, like a huge in a bag at a full of bananas and it was very cheap. I remember, you know, we bought a whole bunch of them, ate a lot for for a while and then we got sick of it. <laughs> yeah. Another moment I wanted to talk to you about was Watergate. You mentioned that that was pivotal for you. Can you explain why that that was so meaningful? Yeah, I mean that, that it was the year that we came in the, in the fall the Watergate broke. And you know, I didn't know the language very well, but we were all in the classroom, we were just watching, we were just glued to TV watching this. And I remember, I mean, a lot of the, from the teachers, the students, there was some kind of sense of embarrassment that this is happening and the whole world is watching. And I remember thinking, I just had a totally different perspective. I mean, I said, you know, what a great country that Things like that happen everywhere, from Korea to England, to the United States to, you know, everywhere. But this is the one country that, God, they're showcasing it on TV. They're not hiding it. They're not, you know, they're not just, just putting it, you know, under the rug here. And I thought, wow, what a great thing. So I, I remember having a different perspective on Watergate than the people in my class. And, and it, this truly is a great country, and that's part of the reason it is. Talking about different perspective, one thing that really comes across in everything that our students have read about you, everything that I've read about you, is that you don't seem to worry a lot. You're okay with chance being part of your life. Where does that mentality come from? I, I think it kind of came since I came here from Korea. It's in a, when you're in two totally different places like that, it's not like coming from England, the United States, where the language is the same, and people kind of look the same. Uh, I think it's so different that everything else in life is kind of somewhere in between. And and I remember thinking, you know, I mean, it's somehow it just worked out. And, and I'm thinking, you know, somehow it is going to work out. So I didn't really spend a lot of time worrying about choosing schools to all that, uh, even even looking for jobs and, you know, whether I should stay here, move around. I didn't really sweat over it. I just assumed that it was going to work out. Uh, now, being a Christian, I know that somebody up there was, was guiding me through. But yeah, I never really worried too much about stuff like that. I think that's partly because I, I really think because of my my background, my early days in Korea and here, that I just think that, you know, this, I think the world was a little bit bigger, that everything else is somewhere in between. Do you think that that comfort with chance and the ability to push worry aside has helped you as a CEO? Has that shaped your approach to leadership? Uh, my bias is I, I think so, because I think when you, lead a company in a business, I mean, you have a lot of obligations. The sales and profits you have to worry about. And it's very easy to overlook some things that are more important, like the values, you know, the, the personalities of, of the people around and the values of the company, or the personality of the company, how we do things. So those are the, those are the bigger things I have to worry about. And I think you know if you worry so much about all the small things that that happen, you know, I'm, I don't I don't need to underestimate the value of the stuff that we do, but you can easily, you know, miss the big picture. So I, I I think you have to constantly look at the big picture and put everything in perspective in life. So I think that worrying about a lot of small things, I think you can lose the sight of the big picture. Absolutely. It looks like we got our first audience question in here. So an audience member wants to know, 
if you had the same opportunities in Korea as you do here, does any part of you wish that you would have stayed there? Uh, honest answer is no. Uh, I think you know, this, this, this may not sound um, I am a uh, you know, <clears throat> good Korean, but I mean, it's a, this is the greatest country in the world. I know it because I've been on the other side. Uh, I can't think of a better place for me to live and raise my family. Uh, and, and so I'm glad I'm here. Again, I didn't make the decision to come here, but I'm, I'm glad I'm here. And, and at the same time, I'm, I'm glad I lived there. I think it's like a lot of people who, I didn't go to military, but I think a lot of people who went through military and, and, and some hardship through that, probably are glad they did that, but they probably wanna, wouldn't want to do it again. I, I think I kind of feel like that. Speaking of, of family, you have a great deal of esteem for your parents. You've talked about their work ethic. Can you tell us a little bit about their values and how those principles shaped your approach to leadership and your life in general? Yeah, because the life in Korea was somewhat difficult at the time, like you know, my father was workaholic. Uh, I think there was probably at least 10 years that I remember that he didn't have a day off. Uh, the reason was because he was supporting not only his family, uh, you know, he, he and his wife and his five kids, uh, but we were also living with our grandparents and, and some of the, the relatives that needed help. Or, you know, I remember we always had aunts and uncles around the house all the time living with us. So we probably had like 12, 13 people living with us, which my father was supporting all of them financially. So, and, and my mom was always, you know, working to feed them and, you know, clothe them and all the things. And so they were working hard all the time. It's, I think the, I think, I think, I think they were workaholic, not because this, that's who they are, but because they were doing it for other people, the family. So I think that's the values that we want. I think we, you know, we have to do things, for the family and future generations and people around us. I think that's what, that's what I learned from watching them, not that, I don't consider myself workaholic, and not that and neither do I want to be. Uh, but I think hopefully I have the same value system as as they did about valuing families and you know looking after them and and you know sometimes sacrifice yourself to to make it better for the future generations. That leads in perfectly to one of the questions a student in our visiting scholars class had. They this person noticed that you've raised your family a little bit differently than, than your father. How do you keep things in balance? How do you set professional boundaries so you have time both for that hard work ethic and close, meaningful time with your family? Yeah, one thing that I uh, remember growing up and if I could ask my, my father especially, because my mother was at home all the time, to be different is that he was so busy that we never really did anything together. So as much as I appreciated what it did for me, that uh, we, we never drew baseball or kicked soccer ball, you know, anything like that, okay? So he was always busy, he was always working. Uh, so I think the, you know, the relationships uh, is based on the quantity of the time people spend, not, not necessarily quality. So show me a parent who says, well, I don't spend a lot of time with my kids, but you know, we spend some quality time. I mean, that's, that's an excuse. So somebody who's guilty. <laughs> so I, I think you gotta spend time doing things. So I think it's, I, I think it's probably better to, to sit with, with your child, watching some silly TV show for a couple of hours together that's probably more meaningful than having some 15 minutes of some so-called so great bonding experience somewhere. I don't know what that would be. So I think you gotta spend a lot of time. So I, I try to spend a lot of time with, yeah, with my children, especially growing up. Uh, then I've grown up, uh, one of them did go to Purdue. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so I, I, I try to do that. I think, I think I didn't think it this way when I was young, but I think probably, uh, you know, having the experience with my father, I probably thought to my somewhere along the line that I probably do it slightly differently. 
Mm -hmm. As a CEO, you have so many people pulling for your time and so many demands. How do you ensure that you're able to carve out that family time? Yeah, I, I think it's a, yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't, I think you can't take, first of all, you cannot take work home because then you'd be just kind of constantly thinking and doing things. So when, when you're home, I think you should, you should be, you should be home. Okay. So yeah, I, yeah, I, I try to do, and, and especially these days it's a little bit easier because you can really, I mean, this year's proven that you can work remotely uh, yeah. with the, with the email, emails and, and things like this. So you can, you can do a lot of things. Okay. And I, I do have to, to be in the office, you know, to show faces and meet with people. I have to do that. But there are a lot of things that you that I don't have to be here as well. Okay. So and this year especially we 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 are really getting good at not being here. It is a whole new ball game. We got another audience question in. This individual wants to know, learning from your own hardworking parents and your own immigration story, what have you taught your children and your family members about work and work ethic? Yeah, I, I, I think they uh I think they learn from just watching. I don't think you can sit a kid down and tell them how you they should be. I think they they all watch. You know, I think, but I do, I do tell them time to time. Probably the most impressive thing a person can show other people is how well they prepare, which is the work ethic, which is just time, you know, time consuming process to get ready for something. And that is the single most impressive thing you can show somebody else. So that's that's work ethic. You know, that's mm -hmm. you got to spend time to do things and be prepared. So I'm, but hopefully I think they just learn by watching, not not by what we tell them to do. So I want to go back to your college years and graduate school for a minute because that is of great interest to our students. Specifically, they really wanted to know, were there any experiences in particular during that time that had an impact on your ability to lead and your ability as a CEO? Yeah, I think, uh, fortunately, I went to a very small college, Clement McKenna. Uh, is, I think right now they have like 1,200 students uh, but at the time that I went there, it was, was less than 1,000. Matter of fact, my entire graduating senior class was 156 people. That's every major combined. So it was very small. So it, it gave us a chance to be active in, in things. I mean, you were always involved. It was very small. Everybody knew everybody. Okay? So you know, having played sports, uh, you know, I was the president of the uh, international Student, student uh, association for five colleges in Claremont. Uh, so things like that had really helped me uh, for what I do now because I was, you know, I had to, I mean, anybody who was doing anything on campus know that it is not easy because you're not paying them to do it. You have to somehow kind of talk them into, you know, doing something that you, which you both value. And so, I mean, it really helped me to grow as as a, as a leader, the, the, how to help people do certain things with me because we both want to do it. So I I, th I think the, having gone to small school really helped. Mm -hmm. Looking back, our students were curious if you to get your take on the differences between studying business in school and that theoretical knowledge and practical experience. Yeah, I, I think the uh, I think a lot of the professional schools, like especially business school, I, I think it's probably overrated, if I may say that, because I don't think you need any special skill set or education to be successful in business or, or become a CEO. I, I have no idea what requirements one should have to become a CEO. I really don't. I don't think there's anything technical. Uh, you know, I don't think I do any math more than calculating and divide, you know, dividing and multiplying. Uh, a lot of it is just common sense and hard work. Uh, so I, I think you know what I learned in business school and college. I, I think is I think it it makes you become a probably more diverse person. 
like you know, having studied the subjects that I will, I will never personally use in business, but makes you a better person. I think having studied history and biology and stuff that I would never study on my own, okay, philosophy to religion to you know, stuff like that, I think it makes you a more well-rounded person. I think that's the value of education. Also, you know, I think you, know, you could be, uh, I think, for example, like engineering is a great background for or in business, because you, you learn how to solve problems. I think, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know as, as a matter of fact, uh, I know that a lot of business schools will really like people from different backgrounds other than business, like engineering. Okay? Uh, I major in economics, which is very theoretical, and I think was very good. Not that I, I use exactly what I learned, but it just makes you a better person in your ability to, in your ability to solve problems. Can think. Talking about, talking about diverse backgrounds, I wanted to revisit a, a funny moment from your, your college years. You had friends that had you convinced that to become an American citizen, you had to sing the national anthem. Do you like singing? Uh, no, I'm actually tone deaf. And now when, when people say they can't sing, they kind of exaggerate, they can sing a little bit. No, I really am told that if I sing a a happy birthday, it will be out of two. Trust me. <laughs> but yeah, it was a, that story was a weird. Yeah, I was in I was a senior, and and I was getting my citizenship, so I'm studying for the you know for the test. She's like, I thought we have to know all the presidents' names and stuff like that. And, and so one of my friends kind of convinced me that they're gonna ask you to sing a national anthem or something like that. So we were driving to so. My friends were driving me to this to this place in downtown Los Angeles, and uh, uh, and we were they were teaching me how to sing the national anthem. I think they had a great time trying because they knew I was taught that. <laughs> that is fun. So going back to your early years after graduation, once you completed your MBA, you were working at ChemMed and you saw opportunity at Roto Rooter. What was it that jumped out at you and, and made you decide to make that move? Yeah, first going back, I think it was a uh, in hindsight. It was a very good decision on my part to come to Kemet, which is unknown, unknown company. So out of Chicago Business School, yeah, it was Kemet was by far the lowest offer that I had received, uh, but it was also smallest company. And the job was different. I was to report to the president of the, the company uh, and do projects for different people in the company. So I thought, hey, that's different. Seems like more than a number. And luck would have it that the same year that I joined Kemet, Kemet bought Rotary, which was a family business from Des Moines, Iowa. So you know, it was a, literally, it was a sewer cleaning company. They didn't do plumbing. They didn't do anything else other than clean drains and sewers. Uh, but it was very small, and and I thought you know it, it might have, it has a chance to grow. So I I moved over there, which was one of the subsidiaries. So I moved over there, and uh, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. So you were at headquarters, and you spent some time there. But then you made an interesting decision. You said you really wanted to get your hands on and and learn the business. So you. Um, took that time. Why was that so important to you to get more hands-on knowledge of what Roto Rooter does? Yeah, I, I was well, I was what 25 years old or something like that. And and I you know I don't forget I came from California to Chicago and I somehow settled in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I think the most Californians think that that's the only place to live. So I, I in my <laughs> mind I thought I thought I would go back to California and, and do something else and, and there were a lot of opportunities back then i mean we were getting calls from what they call headhunters you know offering you know increase in pay to the different company and so on <clears throat> so i i was actually thinking that that might happen to me but i said now if i were to stay with this company i should really learn the business so i i gave some thought and i said you know i'm still young so who knows what this will take me so i decided to to go into the field and learn the business. So at the time, Boston branch was, was probably the best branch in the company. 
So I raised my hand and I decided to go to Boston and work as an assistant branch manager. Uh, just just to learn the business and know and feel you know, what the service technicians and, and telephone operators do day to day. And uh, I am, that's probably one of the best, best decisions I've ever made. I think it really gave me a great perspective on what actually we do and what those people go through every day. You know, it's, it's not easy out there in 95 degree heat driving a, driving a van and going job to job and you don't have air conditioning in your van you know things like that i mean you you really don't know that unless you live with them because it was just a great experience for me and when you're talking about learning you actually went out with the technicians you were doing this on weekends and on holidays what did that time teach you that you could apply as ceo yeah i i i, I tried to go out on the road as often as I can, just ride with them you know, so that I can see what they do in front of customers and some difficult jobs. Yeah, I, I think as a CEO, I think I really understand every aspect of our business and everything that our people do. Uh, I think too often you, if you're in the headquarters and I'm in headquarters all the time and I don't get to do that anymore. If I didn't do it back then, I probably would not have known what I know now about what they do. I might have some imaginations, but wouldn't be the same. And I probably would have underestimated, you know, how difficult the job it is that they do out there. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about your employees, we got another audience question in here. They want to know if you bring that discussion about work and life balance to your company? Is it something you address with your employees? Is it something that you have positioned as being important for the company? Yeah, I, I, I think that people, you know, whether I like it or not, I, I think that people watch me. And and so I I, I think they are just, they, they know me as, as I behave, not, not, not as I tell them. So I, I, I think they see me. So I think, I think we gotta remember that you know, <clears throat> our values as a person is is out there. Uh, they see it all the time, and, it, and I think it does make a difference, good or bad. So I I, I remember all the time that you know I, I I know I'm visible, whether I like it or not. Sometimes maybe too visible, but I'm, I'm visible out there. And uh, you know, I, I think we all have to. Again, a job. This is a job. I mean, this is not. This is not all of your life and you should and, and and i think i think people around me understand that that you know we do this for a living uh but there's a lot more important things in life than work mm -hmm. another audience member wanted to know what's the most interesting experience you've had out in the field oh gosh uh <clears throat> one of the things that i uh it, I'm not sure it's interesting, but it's the most memorable is for a short time we had, uh, I had this idea that that we could venture into the portable toilet business in Boston. Okay? So we bought portable toilets and, and which we rented to mostly construction sites. Okay? And, but then again, there are some needs over the weekends when people have parties and so on. So. I had this brilliant idea that we could we could actually take the toilets from the construction sites over the weekend, clean it, and then you know, provide it to parties and so on, or stadiums. Uh, actually, New England Patriots had at one time sixty some of our toilets because they were fixing their bathroom. Okay. So one time we were so busy that I was actually out there with a rag in my hand, cleaning inside of a portable toilet. <laughs> wow. I'll never forget that. <laughs> so as as you touched on, plumbing is, is not an easy job. What the Roto-Rooter technicians do is, is tough, but it is an essential one. So during pandemic, this needed to continue. The students in our visiting scholars class were really curious on the challenges that COVID has caused and how you as CEO were able to strike a balance between maintaining worker safety and keeping things operational. 
Yeah, this this is obviously you know been the one of the probably the strangest year we've had, and hopefully we won't have anything like this again. But in early, you know, from March to early April, we had to make some decisions. When things looked pretty bleak, uh, our business was slowing down. People did not want technicians to come to their house. Uh, so it was strange, but a business really slowed down. So we had to make a decision. So do we you know, follow our employees, lay them off and hire them back later? Uh, that would have at least save us money. Uh, we decided not to do that. We decided that, you know, we, we it's, it's so hard to hire and train people anyway. So we decided to hang on to the employees and and cut costs everywhere except uh, advertising. Uh, so we spent a little bit more money on advertising. And, and I think the hanging on to our employees was hindsight, uh, the, probably the best thing we did in a long time. Uh, business started to come back in May. Uh, June was actually very good. Uh, July was even better and August was even better. So we are actually going to have a record year in sales and profits, and wow. and yeah, and it is it is yeah, it is very unfortunate in some ways because I think that a lot, some of the small mom and pop businesses didn't survive April, including some plumbing companies. But that's not fortunate, and I don't think it's even right that they had to close a business. But I think that's probably some of the reasons we're also busy. But you know. But I think that we navigated pretty well during this year, so I'm glad where we are. Uh, but I, I wouldn't want to have to do this again. As we move out of this, do you think there are any lasting lessons that the company learned that you may be able to apply moving forward? Yeah, I, I think that life will be different uh, in the future for many ways from businesses. Uh, one thing, one of the things that we had to do early on, uh, you know, we thought that past, there was a in, in early February we thought that there was a possibility of a lockdown. So we had a meeting and we decided to we got to get ready because we have three call centers: uh, Baltimore, Chicago, and Phoenix. So when you call rural branches anywhere in the U.S., you are talking to one of those three call centers, and we have. 100 to 150 people in a room, in a large facility. So if there's a lockdown, uh, I don't know what we would do. They have to work from home. So we we moved pretty fast to make sure that people can work from home. And so we did it without, without, a, without a break. So now that I know that not, not only us, but other companies know that the people can work from home, I think the dynamics is gonna change because yeah, you're still going to come to work, have meetings and so on. But I think the companies now know that, yes, a lot of stuff can be done remotely. So that's here to mm -hmm. stay. And I think that people will, you know, I, I feel sorry for some business like hotels and airlines because I don't think it'll be the same. Yeah. Our students are very eager to pick your brain on leadership. Uh, one student wanted to know, what has been probably the most humbling moment for you as a leader or CEO? And what did you learn from that? Uh, I think the, always the most humbling thing is when you, know, when you make, have to make a decision that, you know, that doesn't necessarily involve money, sales and profits may involve you know, values, uh, ethical issues, and so on. And that's not easy you know, because I, I, am, I am paid to, to perform, but also you know, I'm supposed to be the leader company in, in every aspect. So yeah, you have to balance that. I think that is really hard because there are, there are decisions we make every day so, for example, you know, we have three. The first point is make it a great place to work. Second is provide world-class service. Third is grow the business. And we meet it, 
in that order. So this has to be a great place, great, great place to work. And that is one that I own. So if, if it's about a decisions that we make that has to do with being a great place to work, uh, I get involved heavily. So there are some decisions that are, seems very minute, but I, I would delegate you know, million dollar decisions or something, but it's something about being a great place to work. Uh, I own it. So, okay. for example, I mean, I mean, we have company policies that I may not even agree. And we have like, grooming policies. You know, and and I, I may not agree, but it's a policy that we had because we serve public and certain things we just need to do. And, and because the managers didn't set the policy themselves that now, if an employee has a problem, issues with that, very often times I deal with it personally. I don't think it's fair for my managers to stand up and defend the company or company policy that they didn't set. They, 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 not even, they may not even agree. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think it's always humbling to deal with issues that are more human because those are harder. Those are really hard. It's a lot easier to talk about strategies and you know winning and losing and all that. You know, you know, th those are easier than having to deal with people issues. Of course, talking about people issues and, and the human element, our audience wants to know what is most meaningful to you about being CEO and about leading your company. Yeah, I, I think I think it's you know I really enjoy what I do because of people around. I, I think I think it's you know, I mean it is meaningful looking back that I think we performed pretty well over the years, and and we have a lot of employees that have been here a long time. Uh, we, it's it's not unusual for you see people that have been here 20, 30 years, 40 years working here, even even headquarters. Uh, I think probably more than. Half the people probably work here within ten years, so I, I think wow. people here tend to stay. And I think that you know I am biased, but I think a lot of people do think that I think it's a great place to work. Uh, I think we do a lot of fun things, uh, so those are very meaningful to me. So what what kind of place this is? Because you know when I when I when I retire someday, and I will, I'm I'm 65. Uh, I don't think I'm going to remember the sales and profits and the purposes. I think I'm gonna remember you know, people the, how we did things together and, and fun we had and stuff like that. So that's that's very meaningful to be a CEO and have an impact on on how we do things. Not necessarily what we do but how we do things. I want to touch on your longevity with Roto Rooter because that's something we don't typically see with most millennials today. A lot of people switch jobs several times in their careers and you have been consistent with roto Rooter. what made you stay how did you decide that you wanted to improve this particular company yeah i i, I don't think i set out with any idea that i was going to be here a long time i think it's just kind of happened um i probably would have left if things were really bad uh, i guess the really bad things hadn't happened yet uh <clears throat> But I think there's some also some value in staying around. Uh, I think you learn from difficulties, the problems you face. Uh, you know, if you I mean, if you have a run-in with your friend and you keep changing friend all the time, I'm not sure you're necessarily going to have a good friend. Okay, so I think some of the things you know I learned over the years because I was here, and, and it wasn't easy or it wasn't fun. And I had to probably solve it, or somehow, you know, the resolution for me to for me to move on. And so I, I think I learned a lot just by being here. And I didn't, not that I, I would run from it, but I, I think I, I I was here to have to deal with it. I think looking back, I think it was pretty valuable. But uh, but I I don't want to imply that I think staying in one place is necessarily better things to do. I think some places probably one should move on. To. So it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of true, but I think I learned a lot by, by being in one place. 
Given the landscape that college students are are facing when and this kind of moving from job to job, do you have any advice for people that want to follow in your footsteps to pursue leadership with a in a company? Yeah, I I, I think you know when 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 companies interview people, I, I think they do look at you know, how often people actually move around too. I mean because. You know, people don't just change overnight. So if somebody moves, I mean, somebody's going to assume they're going to keep moving, you know, unless you can convince them otherwise. So I think that you do have to be somewhat careful. I think, uh, you know, so, so so either that or you were just too quick to make a decision to go somewhere. You should really think it through before you you, you choose your career or a company. So I I think, you know, I think I don't think it looks necessarily good. On your resume, who have moved a lot. I don't think it necessarily means that you're not going to get the job or something, but I think it could could look bad. I personally, do I look at that? I think I do. I mean, somebody moved a lot. I, I have to assume that might happen. Mm -hmm. What kind of qualities do you think students should focus on developing if they want to be involved in business, if they want to get into a leadership role? Yeah, I, I think you know, and the leadership. Uh, I don't know exactly what what the leadership kind of is, uh, but you know, I, I think if you have a, a good good values and you, you you enjoy being with people, and and if, if they like you because of who you are, I think that's a, that's a good start. Uh, I think if they don't like you as a person, it might still perform but that's probably that's because despite of you they're gonna perform so i think it's always easier so i think we always have to balance i mean not, not only just the te technical skills but i i think i think we are also try to strive to be a <clears throat> good enough person that other people want to be around want to work for you uh, because we only we only as good as people that work with or for us I mean, it's not, uh, I don't do a whole lot. A lot of people do things for me. Mm -hmm. Do you think growing up in a different country and having experience living in both South Korea and America has informed your approach to leadership as a CEO? And if so, how? Yeah, I, I think always, I think having different perspectives gives you the opportunity, not necessarily a guarantee, but opportunity to to see things differently, have a diverse, you know, perspective on things, and more things to choose from, different approaches. So I think it can be very helpful. I don't think it's a guarantee. I don't think that if you travel the world because you have the means to do so, you necessarily become a better or more diverse or more empathetic person. I don't think it necessarily happens. It's just all what you do with it, but it gives the opportunity. I think to having having seen different different ways, you know, different, different culture. Uh, I think it can help. And I think in my case, I, I look back and say, I, th I think it has helped. I, I don't know what would have been if I didn't do that. Okay. But I think it has helped to see, see different things. Are there any cultural differences that you see kind of seeping into your approach specifically at roto -Rooter? Yeah, I, I think it's a, you know, I mean, I, I was raised in Korea. So whether I like it or not, I think, you know, that's how I was, you know, shaped early on. So some of the cultural stuff that I think you just you just can't avoid. Um, and then I somewhat probably I'm glad I I can keep, you know. So, I you know, I, I am what I consider truly Korean-American. That is, I think I speak both languages, not very great, but equally. And, you know, and I, I don't think in Korean when I'm talking to you, or I don't think in English when I'm talking in Korean. Uh, I, I mix, um, my wife has the same background, fortunately. So we actually, within the same sentences, we actually mix words. There's some words that are just so right in one language than others, and we just, we just mix it. So, you know, I, I think, I think it, it I think it, it, it is it is good that I, I came from different different culture in, in, in some sense okay uh, but I, I don't 
dwell on it that I don't think that it necessarily is something that I use all the time, you know, purposefully. I think a lot of it is just, it just happens. It, it, it is, it is who I am. And I think that, you know, if you look at the spectrum of different people, I think that, that you know, human, humans are human. Human goodness is the same everywhere, should be the same everywhere. So I don't think it's, I don't think it necessarily gives a better opportunity, but, but you have the opportunity to, to see different things. And if you use it wisely, then yes, it'll help you. Our students were curious about how you were treated as an Asian American at the time of your naturalization and how you feel you're treated now. Yeah, I mean, I, obviously, you know, the, the rank does have some privileges. I think that if people who know my position probably uh, treat me differently. Uh, but uh, as an as an as, as an Asian American, and uh, we do go through life, and you you do experience things. You do experience some racism uh, because some people just are not, you know, you know, not well rounded enough to see different people, and it happens, and it, it's it's very hurtful when it happens, and you can't avoid it. So do I experience it? Yes, I, I think, I think, I think every person does experience it. You know, like. And somewhere you, know, you go in, and some people do treat you differently. And now you can't you can't just dwell on it and just kind of get angry all the time. But at the at the same time, yeah, have I gotten angry because of some of the things that people do or say that you know they're just dumb enough to say it that way? Yes. So I mean, I think it does happen. It happens everywhere. But so yeah, yeah, you, yeah, we do have to, you know, racism. It's not about some people that are bad. I think it's just, they just don't know any better. That is, they're not empathetic to different persons, being in different person's shoes. So it's not about the intentions. You know, when I, these days, like for example, there are issues about like, say, you know, Washington Redskins. Yeah. Now they change the team. So I think it's called the Washington football team or something like that, but mm -hmm. it's, a, it, it is not about, I, I think when, when somebody says rescues, I don't think they necessarily mean to put them down. But if they decide, if the person who is rescuing doesn't want to hear it that way, then you have to honor that. Not because you intended to put them down, your intention has nothing to do with it. It's the receiver's feeling that we have to be sensitive to. So this is the kind of stuff that I think is, is good to be able to, and I think you, early on we talked about traveling and different culture. I think it does help to see different side if you have seen enough, that you've been from the other side. So it's easier for me to understand, for example, the issues with rescue names than probably, you know, the people who grew up in the United States, some small town and have not experienced it. Of course. Along with that, do you feel like study abroad might be a useful way to gain some of that cultural knowledge? I think it can. Like I said earlier, I don't think that you travel necessarily makes you a better person, but it gives opportunity. Now, I think it's actually better to move somewhere and live because I think there's a different mindset when you know where you're going back home. So, but I think I think that's the second best thing to do. I think it is, I didn't get to do it, so I don't know exactly what the experience would be like. Uh, my, my younger brother did, uh, but I think in, when you're in college and you play any sports, it's kind of tough to do because you can't skip, skip a season. Or you, at least you can, I guess it's a choice you make. Uh, but I, I, th I think it can broaden your horizon, but it's not a guarantee, it's, it's, it's the person that actually it's going to do something with the experience that it's going to ultimately make a decision, make, make a difference, not just the fact that you've been somewhere. We have another question from the audience. Um, and this person says, you are very good at making opportunities from what seem like small or small offers. You went to a small college. You worked for a small company, at least at first. They want to know, in a large school like Purdue, sometimes you can feel like you're just a number. Do you have any advice for students who might feel like they're overwhelmed by the numbers? Yeah, I think in a, in a college like 
like you know Purdue, or when I went to graduate school, you know, University of Chicago, which is slightly bigger than Claremont. Uh, I think you know all the big places like that. There are small groups. There are small places you can be, whether you say some kind of activities, organizations, something like this. So I think you should, once you get involved in, in, in activities and things like that, then I think you're going to act small. I think the same experience. But so I would recommend, actually, yeah, that's, that, that's a good question. I think in you know, big schools, I think you have to probably make a more effort to be involved because it's so easy to sit in the back of the class and not get involved. Okay, so I, I would recommend because there, there are, I, I think there are a lot of opportunities uh, to do that. In business, adversity is inevitable. It's always part of it. Our students wanted to know how you've maintained your motivation and your positive attitude when you face times like that. Yeah, I, I, I think I think as long as you have perspective that it's it's just a job and it's not life and death and they're all important things that should guide you, then I think it's a little bit easier to handle. I think you live and die by it. I think, I don't know how those people do that because they'll be very stressful. Okay, so I, I, I don't, I don't have a lot of stress. I don't, I don't take it home. I don't sleep on it. Uh, I've never lost sleep because we had a bad month or bad quarter. Uh, you do the best you can and you move on. It's not that I don't care, but I think you gotta have perspective of what is what it's all about. And this is this is what I do uh, part time. Part of my life is this, not not my, not my whole life. And you may have just answered this, but another audience member wanted to know how do you reassure yourself and maintain confidence in light of the pressure that comes with being CEO? Yeah, I, I think there is a, probably pressure if I sit down and think about, think about it. <laughs> but I, I fortunately, I, I don't tend to, tend to do that. So I, I think if you focus on things that are, I mean, you, you have to do the job that you enjoy and you have to do it the way you enjoy it. Okay, there is no, no job description that I think that says a CEO needs to do these things this way. So you have to really kind of uh, find a way that your job is aligned with what makes you tick and you got to make it fun and so that you don't feel the pressure all the time. And I, I, I think I tend to, to do that. I think your job is fun. Uh, I, have, I have great people around me that I enjoy working with. Uh, and I think we try to uh, you know, have the right value systems and we constantly test that we do or not. And so I, I, we, we, have, we have a good time doing it. I don't think it is a stressful job. That's probably why I'm still here and I'm 65, but I really haven't thought about retirement yet. I mean, I should probably do it sometime, but I haven't thought yet because I think I, I just don't have a reason yet. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like we are running out of time this evening. I wondered if there's anything that we haven't covered yet that you would like our students to know that you think would be useful uh, perspective from a CEO for them. Yeah, I just, you know, I remember, you know, when you are young, when you're in school, gosh, that the final looks like it's the, it's the most important thing that you face. And, you know, obviously they would know too, but, you know, that you know, after you're living your life for a while longer and it's not as important as it seemed at the time. So right now, I think, you know, the, 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 what I do with my life, the job, the first job you get, and all that seems like a monumental important. Uh, but I think you gotta keep perspective. I think you, if you choose the right career, it happens to be something that you really enjoy doing, I think you will be okay. I think if you do something because you think you need to be doing that, uh, it, 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 it could be a struggle and very stressful. So I think I think it's 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 good to spend a lot of time thinking about what is it that you really want to do with your life, and and how do I fit that in with what's out there? All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, and I enjoy it. Thank you.
And as a reminder to all of you watching, this session will remain on the Purdue Honors College YouTube channel if you'd like to revisit it or share it with a friend to partake. And be sure to mark your calendars because coming up on October 8th, we will have our next visiting scholar. He is an interdisciplinary researcher hoping to unlock the keys of brain-inspired computing. So thank you all for your time and attention this evening, and special gratitude goes out tonight to the Asian American and Asian Resource and Cultural Center. Have a good night, everyone.